it's good that God has brought us here at the end of the week. It's been an eventful week. God has been good to us. Our thoughts and prayers are for those that are sick um, with the coronavirus. It is spreading like wildfire. And God, we implore him to bring healing to this land, healing to the nation, healing to the people that are sick. There are also over 250,000 people who will celebrate Thanksgiving, which is later this week on Thursday, and there will be several seats missing. There are families that have lost mother and father. Families that have lost multiple members. And so I'd like to ask everybody, wherever you are, wherever you're listening, to say a prayer that the Lord comfort them as they go through the holiday season. The holiday season is pretty tough when you've lost loved ones. But we pray that God comforts them. We're meeting here on the campus and we're still meeting in person. Yes, we are listening to the authorities. Uh, when and if, if and when the time arises that we need to tell you that we're no longer meeting, we will send out a message via our Facebook platform. Uh, but until then, we will meet on the campus, socially distant, masked up, hand sanitized, socially distant. No brotherly hugs or handshakes. Come in one way, leave the other. We will look out for your safety and we will place our lives in God's hands. So join us if you can on a Saturday morning here at 750 West Lucas Road in Lucas, Texas for our worship service. I'd also like to extend my appreciation and thanks and pray God's richest blessing on the praise team and Dr. Marshall and the communication team. There's a team behind all that you see now on Facebook and uh, YouTube and other channels uh, that get this message out to you. And I pray that God richly bless them as they lend their talents, their resources, their time for spreading the word. And thank you, uh, Sister Chaba Dorcas, for the tribute. It took me back many years. You say you sang that song in 1986, last time, yeah. Uh, I, it took me back to those days too. Um, thank you very much, my tribute to you. How can we say thanks for all the things God has done for us? Things that are so undeserved, yet he gave to prove his love for us. And the voices of a million angels cannot, will not express my gratitude for all that I am and that all that I ever hope to be, we owe it to him. So God, to God be the glory. What a prayer that should be on our lips every day. We start in the book of Revelation, so, and we're going to stick with the book of Revelation for the foreseeable future. Now you'll come in here week after week for you, those of you online, and welcome to those online, and you may get a little tired and bored. And you're free to go and join other live streams, but we will be doing Revelation on our stream. If you can't, don't want to come to church, you think that Revelation is a little boring, I don't. I think it's an exciting book. I think it's an essential book for the times in which we live, the day and age in which we live. You're free to go and visit any other church. We'll be doing Revelation right here. Uh, I believe that this is a message that you and I need to familiarize ourselves, refresh up, brush up on. But I believe that there are people out there who are, are, are seeking meaning in the events and the occurrences upon the face of the earth. And the Bible has it. The Lord has told us what's going to happen. We don't have to go to a sidekick to read our palms. All we have to do is put in out the palms of our hands and open Bible to the book of Revelation and we will know what will take place. So I'm confident that you will enjoy these, this series. Last week, we began outlining the, uh, basically an outline of the book of Revelation. How God communicates with man. How he has chosen to communicate First of all, he communicated face to face and then by his voice and then in dreams and in visions and then through the spoken word and the written word, preaching and the written word. That's how he communicates with men and how the book of Revelation is God revealing to us about Jesus Christ. Everybody in the Bible from Genesis right through to Second Peter have been speaking about Jesus Christ and now in the book of Revelation we have a book authored by God about Jesus Jesus reveals himself to us. And he chose to deliver it 
to John on the island of Patmos. And John now shares it centuries later with us. Exciting message there. And the title of this series, this sermon, is to my beloved church. I know you. I love you. Love always. God. That's the title of the message. To my beloved church, I know you and all that you have done. I love you. Love always. God. Let us turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation. And we're going to stay there for a while. The book of Revelation, uh, chapter 2. Now, G Jesus decides he's going to communicate with the church and he's going to write a letter to the churches. Now, when I was in school, letter writing was an art form. You were taught to letter write. Nowadays, you don't write a letter, you just text or video chat, Instagram, tweet. I believe that the art of writing letters is, is lost, almost. But there was an art form to, to writing a letter. Now remember, I said I'm going to teach, to teach this book to you. I'm also going to preach a little today. So I want to get to the teaching part of it. The letter has the introduction, the salutation, the proscript, Mr. So-and-so, the prologue or subscription, the body of the letter, and then you sign off. And the letters to the church which begin, to the seven churches that begin in Revelation 2, have a, have a structure to them. They have like almost a formula. Researchers have, have said that there is a, a covenantal formatting of the letters to the seven churches. First, you have the preamble, which identifies the author. Then you have the prologue, the historical prologue. I know you. So now I can tell you something. Then you have the stipulations, normally in the imperatives, using the imperatives, like for example, repent, remember, do not fear, be faithful, awaken, hold fast, strengthen. The stipulations are the express obligation of the church to God. What we as the church must do in response to God. What he's asking us to do. And then we have blessing and curses. In the case of loyalty, it's a blessing. But if you breach the covenant, it's a curse. And then you have the witness. It always says, hear it, hear, if you have ears, hear what, what? The Spirit has to say. And so we have, throughout these messages to the seven churches, you have the, the preamble, the prologue, the stipulations, uh, the blessing and curses, and then the witness, but it's not always arranged in that format. But as you go through it, go through the seven letters, you will see this format. Why don't you turn in your Bibles, and I want to just illustrate this for you. Uh, Re Re Revelation 2, verse 1, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, here's the preamble, these are the words of the one who holds firmly the seven stars, which are the angels or messengers of the seven churches in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden candlesticks, the seven churches. There's the prologue. The prologue is, I know your deeds and your toil and your patient endurance and that you cannot tolerate those who are evil and have tested and critically appraised those who call themselves apostles. 
and uh, on the stipulation, verse 5. So remember the heights from which you have fallen and do what? Repent. The imperative. And then the prologue continues in this particular church to Ephesus in verse 6. You, yet you have this to your credit that you hate the works and corrupt teachings of the Nickelodeons. And then the witness, verse 7, he, has an, he who has an ear, let him hear and heed what the Spirit says to the churches. And then there's the blessing. To him who overcomes the world through believing that Jesus is the Son of God, I will grant the privilege to eat the fruit of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You see that? The preamble, the prologue, the stipulations, the blessing or curse, and then the witness. And if you go through the other churches, the, 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 the letter to the church at Smyrna, the, chapter 2, verse 8, it, it, it's again the preamble. Uh, verse 2 and 11, uh, chapter 2, verse 9, to the church at Smyrna, prologue is in verse 9, I know you're suffering. Then the witness is in verse 11, he who has an ear, ear, let him hear what the Spirit says, and he who overcomes the blessing, in the latter part of verse 11, he who overcomes the world through believing that Jesus is the Son of God, will not be hurt by the second death or the lake of fire. So you will see this format throughout the letters. Remember, I want you to be taking notes here because we're going to come back to much of what we have said. But I'll lay the foundation. And I want us to be active listeners, take notes, stay awake. The church of Ephesus refers to the first century church, a small band of believers that took on the world. They had an enormous task to spread the gospel. The church of Smyrna existed AD 303 to AD 1313. The church that was persecuted, the church of suffering, Pergamum, A.D. 1313 13 to 538. This is the church that was known as the authoritarian church. The church where human authority sought to replace divine authority. And Nicolosian sought the church to compromise, sought the church to compromise with paganism. Thyatira, A.D. 538 to 1565. This was outright apostasy. The church backslid. Tradition replaced the Bible. Human priesthood replaced Christ. This was it. Where when the Bible was silent or the Bible didn't quite stipulate something, they said human tradition takes over. And then slowly but surely, human tradition replaced the Bible. When the priesthood of a human priest, a human priest replaced God, Christ. This is a time of darkness in the church. A.D. 538, 1565. Sardis, the church of Sardis. The historical period, 1565 to 1740. This was the post-Reformation church. The church that didn't come all the way back from its backsliding and apostasy. The church that all of a sudden slunk and sunk into dry formalism. And then the church of Philadelphia, 1714 to 1844. This is where you have the first and second awakening. This is where there was an emphasis on obedience to God. But this was a small faithful band of Christians. And then we come to Laodicea, which is the modern day church in our age. The lethargic, complacent, proud church. Laodicea. Now, if you're at home and you've recorded all this here, I'm quite sure that our, in, the, in, in, in the comment section we've had the churches and the ages that they represented. We're going to come back to that. 
We're going to come back to that as we go along. But here we see the various churches and their various conditions all being addressed by God. But there's something I want us to notice here. Something I want us to notice. Some of these churches were commended. Some of them were condemned. Some were blessed. Others were cursed. It was a mixed basket of churches. And, but there's something that was consistent with all the churches. And this is what is exciting. This is what is relevant for each and every one of us. So get your Bibles. Let me show you what was consistent. Let's begin in, in Revelation 2. Revelation 2. It says here, verse 2. What are the opening words? This is the church of Ephesus. What, what, what are the open words? I know you. I know your deeds. Right? Let, 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 let's, let, let's go a little down to to Smyrna, uh, 2 verse 9. What is the opening words? I know your suffering, right? Okay, why don't we go to verse 13, the church at Pecanum. What does it say? I know where you dwell. I know, I know, I know. A pattern seems to be emerging. Let's go, I think it is, to, to verse uh, 19. It says, I know your I know your, your, your deeds, right? The, the church at Thyatira, I know your deeds. Then if you go to Re Revelation 3, verse 1, the church of Sardis, it says right there, again, I know your deeds. Huh, right? And then when you go to the church of Philadelphia, in three, chapter 3, verse 8, it says, I know your deeds. Huh? And then if you go to the church of Laodicea, 3.15, it says, I know what? Your deeds, huh? There seems to be a pattern. What God and Jesus is saying to us is I, I'm writing a letter to you as someone who already knows you. I'm writing you this letter. I'm going to rebuke you. I'm going to correct you. I'm going to encourage you. But I know you. I know everything about you. The word know here is the word know on an intimate basis. Now, for those of you who don't have 2,600 words in your vocabulary, Intimate may be elusive. The word no used here is the word, the word that describes having slept with somebody, having an intimate relationship with somebody. The word no here says, I know you both inside and out. I've slept with you. I've seen you naked and I've seen you clothed. I've seen you when you're wide awake and when you've just woken up. I even know what your breathing pattern is when you're fast asleep. I've smelt your breath in the morning. I know you. Huh. You know, to the young folk here, and I made this little segue in this message, I know you. Many of you don't understand what premarital sex does. You know when you've had premarital sex to the young folk that are listening here, having that act of sexual intercourse, that person gets to know a part of you. That is why when you meet that person years later in the grocery store or in the parking lot or at a concert or in the mall, there's a somewhat of a discomfort between the two of you. It's because your minds are saying that person knows a little bit more about me. Jesus is saying to the church, I got you. 
I know you. There is nothing that you as a church can hide from me. You can't lie, lie from me. And even though I know you intimately and I love you, I still want to communicate with you. You know, folk, we didn't get to know the truth because of something that was good in us. You know, many of us Seventh-day Adventists think that because we are Seventh-day Adventists now, we have been translated to heaven and have come back to judge the earth. We think that there's something special, that we, the fact that we are Seventh-day Adventists, and I'm speaking to Seventh-day Adventists, so those of you who are not Adventists, hold on a moment, we're taking care of business internally. We think that we have arrived, that we are a special people, that we are a chosen people, but God didn't choose us and give us the truth that, I, that is in Scripture because of our goodness. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 7. Let's see what the Lord says to his own people. Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7, verse 7. Many of us think that we, 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 we died and went to heaven and came back and now we can judge the earth and that the fact that we are Christian makes us different from others. The fact that if you call yourself saved, that you can be judged you can judge others. Look what Deuteronomy 7, 7 says. And remember, I said that you did not get this truth. You're not sitting here listening to this message, calling yourself a Christian because, of, and, uh, because there's something good about you. Look what he says about his people, Deuteronomy 7, 7. The Lord did not love you and choose you because you were greater in number than any of the other peoples for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. I didn't call you because you are a mighty people. I didn't call you because you are a special person, that you come from some royal lineage or the, the first or second generation that belongs to one particular denomination. I called you because I loved you. You are not the firstborn. You were the runt of the litter. You were not a mighty people. You were a few people. Yet I have chosen you. God wants to reach us because he loves us. I know you. See, baptism is not a sign of righteousness. It's a public declaration that you have no sense. I'm going to say that again. Baptism is not a sign of righteousness. Baptism is just a public expression that you had no sense. You, and you came to the Lord to get things right. The church is not full of righteous people. The church is full of people who are messed up and are works in progress. Many people believe that those in the church are righteous and we the church have given the world the impression that it's an us and them situation. I want to say to those who are discouraged by the church, those who have said that the church is full of hypocrites, those who have said they are leaving the church because they found that the people in church are hypocrites, I want to say to you, hold on a moment. You found the right stuff. The people in church are a work in progress. The thing is, folks, that you, can, you and I cannot discourage God from loving us. You with me? The devil cannot change his mind about us. He loves us. He will continue to pursue us even though he knows us. 
You know, there are some folk who are told, if you know who they are, you keep telling people, I wish you knew who that individual was. You wouldn't trust them. And you convince us not to trust each other because you say you know them. But God knows us and still wants to communicate with us. He knows us and he still loves us. Look at what Deuteronomy 7, 6 says. You know why he does that? He says, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. I think you missed it. You're holy to who? Huh? You're holy to who? He didn't say you are a holy people. Because if he, had he left it there, we would be prancing around like proud peacocks. Saying we are holy people. He says, hey, the world may not see you to be holy, but you are holy to me. The world may not count on you. The world may think you are nothing. The world may look down on you. The world may persecute you. The world may ridicule you. The world may chase you about and tar and feather you. And you're being branded hypocrites and, and liars and fanatics. You may be nothing to the world, but you are holy to me. You are holy unto God. He views you differently. In fact, he says, his signature is upon your soul. And so he knows us. There's something I want to get to here too. The seven churches also actually represent the seven stages of Christian development. The seven churches also represent the seven stages of Christian development. There are some who are listening to me and in this church right now who are from Ephesus. You are enthusiastic. You are overcome by your first love. You don't tolerate any nonsense. You don't tolerate evil. You don't tolerate hypocrisy. You are in love. Your first love. Then there are some right here who are suffering, who are in pain, who have possibly lost a loved one or are going through a tumultuous divorce or your husband just walked in on you and said he wants to leave you or your wife has done the same or you have a child that has gone wayward or is hooked on drugs. You are going through some level of pain. You feel dejected and rejected. You think that nothing is going in your favor, that nothing is happening with you, that you are stuck in a rut. You are going through a level of anxiety. You are suffering. Somebody here is in Smyrna. And then there are some who are busy compromising. Some who are only Christians on Saturday, but heathens Sunday to Friday. Some who are backsliding and are hypocrites. Some who have actually abandoned the faith. You may be here in the church or listening, but your mind and your heart is not in the Word of God. You, 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 you are living a compromised existence. Because some of you are in Pergamum. There's some of you in Thyatira. You've backslidden and apostatized. You've left. You've left the faith. You've denounced Christ. You've neglected and renounced his word. You've, you've left. You believe other things and not that God loves you. Then there are some of you who have been backslidden, who were in a state of apostasy, but are beginning to work your way back. Sardis. But this is the half-baked church. You don't get all the way back. You know what I've noticed? That people who have had a difficult background 
normally when they come back to the church, become the most legalistic. You'd never believe they set their foot wrong one day in their lives. As a rule of thumb, as a pastor, when I see a brother who is on the ball, when I see a brother who is condemnatory and judgmental, when I see a brother or a sister who is hard on others, I ask myself a question, what is it that you haven't come back totally from? A bunch of half-baked Christians, not all the way back from apostasy, not all the way back from backsliddenness. You come and you slip into a dry formalism. And I want to say here this morning, I dare say that there's somebody listening to me, somebody in this church who is in Sardis. Then we have Philadelphia, Revival. A small band who talk about obedience to God. Who have probably gone through all the other stages of Christian development. They've, they've had a first love and then they, they've gone through some hardship and then they've made some compromises and then they've back, backslidden and apostatized and now they've worked their way and shook, shook their way free through Sardis and now they are revived. They are now returning to the state of brotherly love. And then most of us are in Laodicea. Do you know that Laodicea is the condition of the Christian church universal in these days? The Christian church universal. Most of us say Laodicea is the Seventh-day Adventist church, and I don't like it when pastors preach that way. Laodicea is the condition of the entire Christian church. The entire Christian church. You see, the Lord, the God has sheep that are not of this flock. If most of us believe that we've been baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church and that we're going nowhere, that we are the ones that are going to be singing, redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, that we are part of the 144,000, I have a surprise for you. The best days of the gospel are yet to come. The Holy Spirit will be poured out in full measure and everyone will receive the, 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 the Sabbath teaching and they will accept and there will be baptisms by the thousands. This is not the time to leave the church. And I want to say to anybody out there, I ain't going nowhere. The choir may abandon me, I'll sing. You want, they don't want us to return a tithe, I'll give my offering. If there's nobody at church, I'll be the lone figure in church. I'll even learn to play the piano if the pianist leaves. But I am not leaving the church. Because God knows this church. And, and despite everything and anything that the church does, he still loves this church. The devil can't be persuaded, cannot persuade him to leave this church. So I am here in the church. Hypocrites, politics, sin, hypocrisy, I'm here. Disfellowship me. I'm here. Disfellowship me, I'm here. Disfellowshipping me is just an act of man, but I know that God still loves me and he knows me. So I'm here. You want to fire me for keeping the Sabbath? I'm here. You want to stop me from trading, buying or selling because of what I believe? I'm here. I will not leave the church. Come up with stories about me. Spread rumors about me. Give me the cold shoulder. I'll bring a blanket to church. I'm here. I will not leave the church. But Laodicea is a condition that affects us as a church. And I want to say to those who have been disappointed by the evangelical church, the white evangelicals, those that say that, 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 that we've abandoned Christ. Let me say this to you folks. God has not abandoned the church. The church may go off the rails, but they cannot abandon its founder. You can't strip him of 
his status as the founder of this church. And you know what the thing is? In the beginning, if you look in the book of Revelation, in the beginning, Jesus is walking where? In the midst of the candlesticks, right? But after the church of Laodicea, where is he? He's standing on the door and knocking. In the beginning, he was amongst us. Now that we think we're rich, now that we think that we have made it, now that we think we're intelligent, we have worked God out of the church. But let me say this to him, you, he's not going to leave the church. He will embarrass himself and stand on the, uh, on the, by the door and knock. And he'll call out. You know, many years ago I had a, I have a, a, a relative, a cousin. This is illustrating Jesus standing at the door and knocking, being able to embarrass himself just to get back at us, get in to us. She, she dated a younger man. And you know, there was an age in time where dating a younger individual, they call them cougars now in this day and age, but dating a young individual was embarrassing. You, they, they would come to family gatherings. This little young man would try and brave big man with this older woman. And everybody would just, you know, you, 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 you're so embarrassed you can't even make eye contact with them. You know, it, it, it's just, and, and, when, and when they walk away, you catch others, you know, gazing as if to say, well, what, what is that? It's, it's embarrassing, eh? And so eventually, this relative of mine broke off the relationship with the young man. And this young man tried everything in the book to get back into my, 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 my cousin's good grace. He tried everything to get back into the good graces. Everything, flowers, fruit, chocolate, cards. He tried everything. But she moved on. And then something happened. He heard that she was seeing someone her own age. And one evening, I was called by this dear cousin of mine and told, hey, can you please come to my house? What's going on? This young man is outside, knocking on the door. What is he doing there, that fool? He wants me to open the door. Why? Because he knows my new relation, my new boo is in the house. So I drove out there and I saw this young man. Every man and his dog in the neighborhood along the street was watching him. Embarrass himself. He was knocking, asking her to come out. His buddies from the neighborhood went to him and said, listen, why don't you go and then come back in the morning? Meet her when she's on her way to work. Or go see her at the office tomorrow. He said no. He was going to get in. This young man knocked well into the night, embarrassing himself. He threatened to do more than just knock. He threatened to derobe. He was prepared to embarrass himself to the point where he wanted to knock naked and he was calling a name. People got tired of hearing him and went to sleep and went to bed. Lights were turning off. You could hear people saying, quiet, quiet, from their homes. But he kept knocking until early hours of the morning. Eventually he gave up. Now, why did I tell you that story? It's because Jesus is prepared, God is prepared to embarrass himself and knock at the door until you let him in. I want to say to those young folk who perhaps are drunk or have given to alcohol or tobacco or weed, come into God's house with alcohol hungover, tobacco on your breath, yes, even high on your weed. Come and sit in the pews. God will fix you. He won't let you go. The church made up 
by, by men may judge you and want to say this is not a very good example, as if we are paragons of, of morality and good examples, that we are not hypocrites. Let me tell you, God knows you in your drunken stupor. He knows you when you are high and when you are low. He knows you when you are happy and when you are sad. And there's nothing that will separate you from his love. The church has become very formalistic. We will judge you. We will tell you that we don't want your dress to be so high. We don't want to see makeup and earrings. We want you to dress a particular way and eat a particular way. My suggestion is because what God has demonstrated, come to him and he will fix it. I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him. I want to say this to the Grace Fellowship family, literally on the campus and virtually. God is not finished with us. God is not finished with us. God will not abandon us. He won't abandon his church. I want us to keep this message and the content very close. I've spoken about the historical significance of the churches, given you some dates. I've spoken to you about the seven stages of Christian development that mirror the churches, Ephesus, first love, Smyrna, suffering and struggle, Pergamus, compromise, Thyatira, apostasy, altogether apostasy, Sardis, half-baked, slipping into dry and empty formalism, Philadelphia, some revival, Laodicea, you're uninterested, not committed, low energy, complacent, dismissive. The seven stage of Christian growth, the seven churches. We will dig into this a little more in coming series. The book of Revelation is meant to revive us. It's not meant to scare us. And here we have seen in the book of Revelation a letter by God to us, to the church, to you and I, that says to my beloved church, to my beloved church, I know you and what you've done. I love you. Yours truly, God. Many of you don't come to church because you think you are far out the palm of grace. Many of us have given that impression that if a brother is eating pork or uh, drinking alcohol or a glass of wine or, or whatever, we, we say you've sinned and therefore you shouldn't come to church. And if you come to church, this is what we expect of you here. I want to say this to you. God hasn't given up on you. In fact, those of us who remain in the church who are overcome by self-righteousness, God is still working on us. There are no saints here. If there are any saints, please send me a picture. Send me a pic of your wings even if they are sprouting on your back if you are a saint or an angel I want to see it each of us are a work in what? in progress God ain't finished with us we can't shake him so what have we learned today? we've learned about the seven letters we've learned about the structure of the seven letters We've learned about the historical significance of each church giving dates, and we're going to study that a little further. And we've learned about the seven stages of Christian growth and development. What stage are you at? Are you in the stage of your first love? Are you struggling or suffering, feeling dejected and rejected? Or are you compromising? 
Or have you completely black sitted in a state of apostasy? Or have you been trapped in the state of dry formalism, half baked, come back from the backslidden and apostolic, the, the apostasy phase, and now you are you are in that point of dry formalism. Or are you in the state? Are you being revived? Or are you uninterested, not committed, low energy, complacent, and dismissive? What stage are you at? I ask you that question, not to guilt you, but to say to you, God is not finished with you. God knows you. He loves you. And he still wants to communicate with you. And so he's standing at the door and knocking. And I encourage you to open that door and let him in. Let us pray. Father, We have read your letters in passing to the seven churches. We're going to study them in depth and we pray for your guidance as we do. But the foundation has been laid, Eternal Father, that you will not be persuaded to abandon your church, us. That you know us and you know us intimately and even though you know us intimately and you know what we've done, where we stay, you know when we stand up and lie down, when we walk out, when we come back in, you you know everything about us. You, You know us at our ugliest and at our best. You know our hearts and the intent of our hearts. Even though you know, Father, our inner beings, you still love us and want to communicate with us. And Father, regardless of the state that we are in, in our Christian experience, in our personal lives, you you have counsel for us, you you have given us instruction, imperatives. If we are sinning, you say repent. If we are discouraged, you say be encouraged in my word. If we have backslidden and moved from where we first met you, you say return to your first love. There are things that you have given us, shown us, instructed us, counseled us to do if we are to return to you, if we are to be yours as you intended, if we are to make our calling and our election, your choice and ordination of us sure and confirmed. There are things that we must do. First, we must recognize, dear God, the state in which we are. Because each individual listening and under the sound of my voice is at one phase or state of the seven churches. They're either at their first love or they're compromised or they're backslidden or they're just basically lukewarm or they're consumed with dry formalism. Each of us are at a different stage of the seven churches and yet you wrote letters to those churches appealing to them to let you in. So, Father, help us to identify what phase of Christian growth we are. Admit it to you and let you in so that, Father, you can realize in us the work that you have begun in us. So bless us as we study the book of Revelation. Bless us and teach us from this word. Revive us, eternal Father. And where our efforts are inadequate, Holy Spirit, step in. Now hear the prayers of those who are calling upon your name this morning. In every corner of the earth, somebody recognizes and realizes that the state and phase in which they are and are saying, Lord, thank you for knowing me and for choosing me. Now come in. Hear those prayers, eternal Father. And there are those who cannot bring themselves to utter a word and a cry for help, but you hear the groanings of their soul. Respond, dear God, I pray. 
the Father, the best is yet to come. What exciting times in which we live. Encourage our hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.